You're all very, very welcome. Uh, I particularly welcome again the Grosvenor uh, School, high school pupils who were in at our economy committee meeting this morning for a brief period. They were very fortunate they didn't have to stay too long. Uh, but obviously, I hope they're enjoying their day up here and we're delighted uh, to see them. I'm also delighted to be uh, asked to say a few words at the start of this se uh, session for case. I'm, I'm I, you know, very supportive of the idea of this exchange of knowledge, of the involvement of the uh, the universities with the assembly. I think that can only be good for policy making uh, going forward. Uh, and so I'm, I'm, I'm very encouraged by the number of seminars that have been held and the output from them. Uh, I'm also uh, noticed the difference in terms of approach where anybody who speaks here, it has to be evidence based and uh, supported by knowledge and you're not allowed to interrupt your opponents. Uh, so and thankfully those rules don't apply down in the chamber or there wouldn't be very much said. Uh, but uh, I think the, the particular seminar today obviously has an interest uh, for myself and uh, for my committee uh, because it uh, hitting as it does on the themes relating to the economy, incentivising investment, competitiveness as well as managing public debt. And competitiveness is at the heart of the executive's current economic strategy first introduced in 2012 and it sought to build an economy in 2030 that would be characterised by a sustainable and growing public sector where a greater number of firms compete in global markets and there is growing employment and prosperity for all. And those are fine words. Obviously, our task here is to match that with policy interventions which help support that outcome. So that, that, it is, that sought to reflect the broad priorities of the executive, the programme for government 2011 to 2015. Of course, we're now it focused on rebalancing and rebuilding the economy in the aftermath of the 2008 recession. We're now obviously in a new scenario, a new mandate, 2016, uh, a, a certainly a new set of uh, political and economic circumstances. And the executive's new programme for government is in its second iteration, I think, at the moment. It's not yet finalised, but the current draft has placed a focus on economic competitiveness. Uh, in the draft one, it stated that we prosper through a strong, competitive, regionally balanced economy. Uh, so the Committee for the Economy awaits the executive's forthcoming revised economic strategy, which is anticipated to reflect the new economic realities that we find ourselves in. And under our scrutiny and policy development role, the committee has started to take evidence to inform its scrutiny of the forthcoming revised strategy. We did, if uh, people were watching this morning, uh, they know the evidence session has just started when the pupils had leave, but we had Invest NI uh, today at the committee for quite a lengthy session, uh, which did focus on their performance to date under the old economic strategy and how they will link into and reflect the new priorities and the new indicators and commitments that are in the new program for government, which will in turn inform the economic strategy. So it was quite an interesting session. Invest NI are obviously a key part of the Department for Economy and Delivery uh, in terms of economic development and growing a strong and competitive uh, economy. So we will also watch to see how the executive will use its newly devolved corporation tax power, and I know that's uh, one of the subjects here, which does offer us a new economic lever. And all this occurs at an interesting time, as I said, when the, the British government works to consider and address Brexit-related decisions following the European Union referendum. The Assembly keeps abreast of the challenges presented by those decisions, seeking to ensure the Executive works to ensure our interests are well represented with the British Government. So today's seminar will provide relevant and useful academic findings that could help inform future Assembly work in the areas I have mentioned. The four papers to be presented are from academics at Queen's, Uni Ulster University, I have to keep uh, correct myself, University of Ulster, I was a former graduate so I'm still in that mode, uh, uh, the, and the Open University. And first, we'll hear from Dr. Gareth Campbell, who will explore how we should respond to corporation tax cuts in Great Britain and in the South. The presentation provides insights into how we might maximise the benefits of a lower corporate tax rate by committing to match any cuts uh, in the main rate in Britain. And second, we'll hear from Richard Johnson and Laura Heary, who outline findings from work undertaken at Ulster University's Economic Policy Centre on the Northern Ireland Competitiveness Scorecard. And their presentation focuses on outcomes, economic, quality of life and environmental, the economic environment, labour supply, productivity, etc., and policy drivers, education, skills, innovation, research and development, all areas of work that our committee are starting to provide uh, and focus on to ensure that we can, uh, we can uh, 
influence the policy that comes out of the Programme for Government and the Department of the Economy's Economic and Investment Strategies. Then Dr Sharon Clement's presentation will reflect on strategic infrastructure investment approaches adopted by the British and Scottish governments, highlighting them as potential strategies for increased social infrastructure investment here. And I've been in committee all day, so I'm not sure if others may know that we're waiting on the Chancellor's autumn statement to see if there is any significant uh, infrastructure bounds for us in terms of uh, uh, resources available to invest. But uh, who knows? I know that uh, we are particularly challenged uh, in terms of investment, investment generally, but certainly investment in infrastructure. And obviously, investment in infrastructure is a key economic driver as well. So these things aren't uh, economic driver in terms of job creation, but also in terms of uh, spreading regional growth, uh, uh, which is a key feature uh, in the first draft uh, of the programme for government. And finally, Dr. Dimitris Soteropoulos, I hope I've got that right, uh, will discuss a number of policy options on how public debt can be managed in a sustainable way, and that's an important issue for all governments. So, I, as I say, I, unfortunately, I have other business to attend to, but thankfully our own uh, staff and policy people here ensure that whatever is said here and the, the content of today's discussion is made available to us, and we do rely, as all the committees rely, uh, on the Assembly research staff here to assist us in the work that we're doing. So even though, unfortunately, I'll not be here to hear the presentations because I have to go and do other business, uh, I will be able to avail of them uh, in the time ahead, as will the committee, and, and hopefully, if the executive are listening, as will they as well. Uh, so I uh, very much want to welcome those who are contributing, those who are up here to listen in. Uh, I hope that it's a very informative discussion, and I hope, in turn, that it assists us uh, in terms of scrutinising the work that the Department of Economy is doing and making our contribution in terms of policy development uh, to the department. So it's with great pleasure then I can introduce Dr. Gareth Campbell to start the show on the road today. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, so my name is Gareth Campbell and I'm going to talk about how Northern Ireland should respond uh, to corporation tax cuts in the Republic of Ireland and Great Britain. So um, as you might be aware, uh, Northern Ireland uh, recently committed to actually reducing the rate of corporation tax to about 12.5% from uh, April 2018. And the idea was that if you cut corporation tax, you attract in lots of uh, uh, people who would actually want to uh, bring jobs, who actually want to invest in this country, and that would hopefully uh, be very, very useful. Um, now, the particular rate of 12.5% was set to actually match the rate that exists in the Republic of Ireland and to be a bit lower than the rate uh, in the rest of, of Britain. And at the time, that sounded very, very sensible, but there's actually been a lot has happened since then. So since Fresh Start has been signed, uh, there's been quite considerable changes. So the first one is uh, Donald Trump has uh, been elected uh, as president in America. Now, one of his commitments was to actually bring down the rate of corporation tax to about 15% over there. Now, uh, what that will do if it goes ahead is actually make it much more attractive for firms based in America to actually stay there. And it makes it less likely that they'll actually come over here and want to uh, invest in this country. So that could potentially be um, a, a, you know, a, a, you know, something that this, that's going to actually concern us about whether we can actually attract a good quality investment from firms which are based in America. Um, at the same time, the Republic of Ireland has also announced new measures in its corporation tax, so it's going to keep the headline rate of 12.5%, but for companies that are linked to research and development, it's only going to charge 6.25%. Now, those are precisely the types of companies that we would like to get, so companies who are involved in, uh, you know, that are actually going to bring jobs which um, are very, very good quality, which are going to involve um, jobs which uh, are, uh, will hopefully have uh, good pay, uh, they will be faced with a 6.25% rate in the Republic versus 12.5% um, in Northern Ireland. So obviously, again, that might be a concern for us. Um, in uh, Britain, uh, there's obviously been the vote to leave uh, and to take part in Brexit. Now, uh, this has uh, concerned some businesses. To try and keep those businesses, to make sure that they actually stay um, in, in Britain, there has been suggestions to actually dramatically cut the rates of corporation tax there as well. 
And you can see a headline here that there's been uh, discussions to actually lower it as much as 10%. Now, even if it doesn't fall as much as that, it's very, very likely that the, the rate in Britain will fall. And just two days ago, uh, Theresa May said that Britain was committed to having the lowest rate um, across the, the uh, 20 uh, economies in the world, which are our largest. So again, we have this concern that uh, rates are being cut around us, um, and uh, how is this going to affect Northern Ireland? Now, in terms of Great Britain, this is what I, I want to focus on, because um, the actual cost to us is, is very closely linked to what happens in Britain. So um, to, to sort of illustrate what has been happening in the past uh, with, with rates, back in about 2006, the corporation tax rate in Britain was about 30%. And at that point, if Northern Ireland had introduced this 12.5% rate, it would have made a very, very substantial difference. But since 2006, there's been very gradual and very steady uh, declines in the rates of corporation tax. And it has fallen by about 1% per year each year. And it's um, currently about 20%. It's projected to fall to about 17% by 2020. Now, what I've done here is illustrate um, what might happen after that. So what was basically assumed implicitly under Fresh Start was that the rate of about 18% that was going on uh, when that was signed would actually continue. And it would just flatten out, um, as shown in this red line. What I would argue is probably more likely is that Great Britain just continues its trend. It continues to cut by about 1% per year. Now, if it does that very, very quickly, it will also end up with a rate of about 12.5%. And any advantage which Northern Ireland once had uh, completely disappears if it simply maintains that 12.5% rate. So this could um, obviously be seen as a major problem. But an another way to look at it is that it actually brings some opportunities. Because what's interesting is Northern Ireland doesn't have to stick with 12.5%. Uh, that is what most of the debate has been about. But actually, uh, written down in law, it says that Northern Ireland can choose any rate it wants. And it is actually up to the Assembly what rate it sets, and that can change if, if uh, the Assembly wants it to. Now, some people might say, well, OK, it's possible to change it, but it might just be too expensive to go any lower. But actually what um, happens is the, the cost to the executive actually critically depends on the rate that exists in the rest of Britain. So if that rate in Britain is going to fall, it can actually mean that Northern Ireland could afford to cut rates further. And you could see this as a really good opportunity to actually give Northern Ireland an extremely low corporation tax rate. One that could potentially set it apart from uh, many, many other countries and could make it very, very attractive to corporations from around the world. OK, so to try and get, get some idea of uh, what uh, might happen, uh, what I've done is put together some estimates of costs and benefits. Now, um, the official estimates of how much this is going to cost haven't been uh, released publicly yet. So what I've done is based it on a past document by the Treasury, which was put out in 2011. And it puts together uh, some estimates for what costs might have been. Um, and also the potential investment which might come uh, from uh, these, these uh, changes. Now, what I've done is then I've updated them into different scenarios. So uh, instead of uh, what was actually published in 2011, look at what was agreed essentially under fresh start, and then uh, potentially what might happen if Northern Ireland responds in different ways. So this is a little background. I won't go into it in a huge amount of detail, but just to explain sort of where these numbers roughly come from. Again, they, there, there can be some debate about, about the exact numbers, uh, but hopefully this will give us um, a general guideline. Um, basically, what we, we need to do is estimate how much uh, Northern Ireland would have to pay uh, to actually cover the cost of cutting corporation tax. So the way to think of that is, well, how much corporation tax would be earned in Northern Ireland if there were no cuts? So uh, we can look at that. We can get estimates for how much might be earned in uh, the entire, uh, right across Britain. Then what we do is we say, well, Northern Ireland has consistently earned about 1.3% of corporation tax receipts across Britain, and we would assume that's going to continue. So if we combine the estimates of what might happen, we can then uh, predict, well, Northern Ireland should earn 
roughly about £600 million of corporation tax each year if nothing changed. But if Northern Ireland does cut, let's say it goes to 12.5%, then it's going to lose roughly about a third of those. So the actual, what we call um, the, the direct effects loss, um, you can see sort of charted here, um, is um, quite substantial. But it's not the only cost that, that actually has to be faced. Um, there will be what we call profit shifting. So companies will come into Northern Ireland, they'll be attracted by this 12.5% rate. Now some of those will be from uh, outside Britain. That's actually really good because they'll now be uh, they'll actually um, declare profits in Northern Ireland. Uh, they'll get charged 12.5% and that additional tax revenue could potentially offset the cost uh, to us. But uh, there's also profit shifting from other firms within Britain. Now that actually uh, means a loss to the Treasury. So instead of paying the, 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 the rate um, in England, they simply move across to Northern Ireland. That uh, cost, that actual amount that those companies save, will have to be borne by the executive. The other big cost is what we refer to as tax motivated incorporation. And this is actually uh, where small businesses uh, can either choose to pay income tax or they can choose to incorporate, they pay corporation tax and then taxes on dividends. Now, if you lower the tax rate on corporations, then it becomes more attractive to actually become a corporation and um, they then pay less taxes. Again, the Northern Ireland executive will have to cover that cost. So we put this all together and we get what we think might be the total cost of this cut. So what was basically agreed at fresh start, uh, you can see sort of along the bottom here. So you're talking roughly about maybe 230 million pounds per year, uh, which, uh, was, was basically what was assumed uh, when that agreement was signed. Then what we do is we estimate, well, how much uh, investment could actually come into Northern Ireland as a result of this? So if tax rates are lower, hopefully it brings in new companies, hopefully they invest, how much could potentially come in? And again, you can debate about the exact figures, but uh, using the methodology I put together in this document for the Treasury um, and extrapolating, uh, again, you can come up with some numbers and you can see those just summarised along the bottom. So it's going to settle down probably about 280 million. So uh, that's just sort of a, a bit of an idea about how this methodology comes about. What I'm going to do is then apply this in different ways to see what might happen if Northern Ireland actually tried different rates. So to summarise the, the, the key points from that, um, this is uh, assuming under fresh start that the Great Britain rate was 19% and then 18%. Northern Ireland stays at 12.5%. You have the cost, you have the investment. What's critical here is that the amount of investment you're expected to get is quite substantially more than the actual cost which is going to come from it. So that suggests uh, when it was signed, it was a very, very good idea and you should go ahead with it. But um, let's say that doesn't happen. Let's say that instead of 19% uh, and then 18%, the Great Britain rate actually falls further. And it does what we saw in that graph of just cutting about 1% each year. What then would be the potential costs and benefits? Well, what we can do is again um, put together some estimates of this. So uh, if um, it goes ahead with this, so uh, it's, uh, the, the government has already announced that it will be 19% for a couple of years. But already they've announced it will fall and it's going to be at least 17% after that. Very likely, it will fall further. And if it does so very, very quickly, uh, the, the rate in Great Britain could also fall to about 12.5%. Now, what does that then mean for Northern Ireland? Well, first of all, costs are going to come down. So if there's no difference between the rate in Britain and the rate in Northern Ireland, uh, the, the actual cost to us is going to be substantially lower. But what's critical is that the amount of investment that's going to come in falls even further. So it falls really, really dramatically. And the reason for that is that how I've, I've modeled this is that basically corporations look ahead and they try and you know, forecast, well, not only what's happening now, but what might happen next. And if they, if they see that over uh, the next, say, five years, the rate in Britain is going to fall and it's going to come down to the rate that, that's going to happen in Northern Ireland, there's actually not much incentive for them to come to Northern Ireland. 
they just stay where they're at or they just choose uh, Scotland or Wales or England and they do a lot of their investment there. And if you put through the numbers, it actually looks as if the amount of investment that could come in is substantially less than the cost the executive would have to pay. And yet this is precisely what is, is going to happen if, if nothing changes. So by default, we're, we're going to stick with 12.5%. We're not going to respond. But this isn't a, a very, very good option. It might potentially leave us much worse off than um, uh, if, if we'd actually done nothing and just sort of stuck with, with the rate in Britain. Um, another uh, potential thing Northern Ireland could do is respond ad hoc. So it doesn't do anything now. Uh, it says, well, maybe you know, if Britain does cut further at some point in the future, we might cut as well. What I would argue is it's probably unlikely that major cuts will go through. Um, if, it, if it has to be agreed each year, and if it has to sort of uh, be approved, then um, it's unlikely you'll get very serious cuts. I've modelled it here that we're assuming there is going to be a further 1% cut down to 11.5%. So that leaves us very marginally um, uh, um, ahead of, of Britain in terms of, of the tax rates. But the pattern remains very similar. There's not much incentive for companies to come in, so investment isn't that high. But again, we have to face the costs, so um, the, the actual outcome isn't very good for us. Now, the uh, other possibility that we can do is to actually say, well, we pre-commit now and we announce now that we will match any cuts in Britain. So uh, if Britain cuts, we also cut. If they cut by 1%, we cut by another 1%. If they cut by 2%, we cut by 2%. And uh, basically, if we, we were going to down, uh, uh, go down that line, we should actually already announce that we're going to cut to 11.5% because the British rate has fallen from 18 to 17 um, since the Fresh Start Agreement was announced. If the, the, the rate in Britain falls further, let's say it rates, uh, falls to 12.5%, then the rate in Northern Ireland would automatically fall uh, very, very low. So uh, up here I've projected it to be about 7%. And potentially Northern Ireland could end up with a really, really low rate which would make it very, very competitive right across the world. It would make it stand out and could potentially attract lots and lots of investment. Now, if you do the various costs and uh, the various estimates of investment, you actually find that it gives you pretty much exactly what was agreed under Fresh Start. So it's not like we're trying to sort of get more costs here. It's, it's not that, that um, it would actually cost the Northern Ireland Executive any more than has already been agreed to. Because the cost depends on the difference between Northern Ireland and Britain, uh, basically if we maintain that differential, we maintain the same cost. And potentially you get at least as much investment, if not more, than was hoped for under Fresh Start. So uh, this, uh, to, to actually pre-commit to this, to make sure it happens, uh, would give companies a lot of awareness of it. They could plan ahead and they could actually plan for investment and make sure they come to Northern Ireland. And this could potentially give us a really good outcome. Um, another uh, possibility, which is, is probably more controversial um, still, is that we actually focus on uh, the tax rate paid by large companies. So historically, there's been two rates of corporation tax in Britain. There's been the main rate, which is paid by companies who make profits over 1.5 million, and there's the small profits rate. Now, the small profits rate doesn't actually really attract much foreign direct investment. It doesn't really, uh, companies based in America aren't going to think, well, you know, it's worth our while moving over because of this small profits rate. The thing that matters to them is the actual rate that's paid on uh, profits above 1.5 million, this main rate. So if we target the cuts on the main rate, uh, we can actually afford to cut that even more dramatically. If you keep the small profit rate the same, you could actually afford to cut the main rate by 1.5% for every 1% cut in Britain. And that would leave you with an exceptionally low corporation tax rate, uh, which would be very, very attractive to large companies. So what's the, the conclusion of the, all this? Well, basically, if we go ahead and do what is planned at the minute, we just maintain the 12.5% rate. That's actually the worst possible thing. So we have to bear the cost of it um, uh, uh, over these, these next few years. But companies look ahead. They realize that it doesn't really set Northern Ireland apart. So investment doesn't actually increase that much. Responding on an ad hoc basis, 
gives a slightly better outcome, but it's not that much. Um, if we actually want to uh, get what was expected under fresh start, if we actually want to get the amount of investment that was hoped for, we actually need to pre-commit now and say, we will match any cuts in Britain. We will maintain that differential and we will make Northern Ireland extremely competitive, much more so than anywhere else in Britain. If you want to go even further and really set yourself apart, then you just target this main rate and you could potentially attract lots and lots of companies. Now, some people might say, well, you know, maybe uh, I've, I've got this wrong. Maybe Britain will stop now. Maybe they've, they've done all these cuts in the past. They're, they're not going to do any more. Um, what, what happens if we actually announce that we're going to cut um, and match these cuts in Britain, but Britain doesn't cut? Well, that's fine. Uh, if if we, we make that announcement and Britain never cuts, well, it leaves us just exactly where we are. We just maintain everything. We, we stick at 12.5%. It hasn't cost us anything at all. But if Britain does cut, then we can respond. We do it, um, we do it immediately. And even having this pre-commitment should make us more attractive to actually bringing in foreign direct investment because it sets us apart as saying we are going to be pro-business and it means that we can actually make this commitment and say uh, if you come to Northern Ireland you will always have an advantage over anywhere else that you could possibly invest. So if we make this commitment up front I think that that would be the best possible outcome that we could achieve. So thank you very much for your time and I think there's a discussion afterwards I'll take questions then. Thank you. Thank you.